Good morning. Please silence all electronic devices for the duration of the meeting. Welcome to the August 21st, 2023 Strategic Planning and External Relations Committee. My name is Julia Mandel. I serve as Hart's General Counsel, and I will start the meeting until you elect a chair for this committee. The meeting format is hybrid. Quorum is physically present at the Hart Administrative Office, and the rest of the board members are participating via CMT. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Staff, can you please do the roll call? Yes, ma'am. Director Hudson, or Director Johnson? Here. Mm -hmm. Director Kemp? Here. Director Schistler? Here. Director Williams? Here. Thank you. And then also present, we have um, Harp Board Director uh, Rena Frazier. And you do have a quorum. Thank you. Next agenda item is public comment. There was no one scheduled to speak. Is there anyone present for public comment? Not to my knowledge. Then this concludes the public input section of the meeting. Next, we have to go to the election of committee officers. The decision had been postponed since the, la since the meeting on March 20th, 2023, due to a lack of quorum. We do have a quorum today, so we are prepared to proceed forward with uh, the election of officers. Um, and I will go ahead and chair the process for the election of the chair. Are there any nominations for chair of the Strategic Planning and External Relations Committee? I'd like to nominate myself. Are there any additional nominations? Hearing no additional nom oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I, I did hear Ms. Kemp, I'm sorry. She, she had nominated herself. Sorry. Okay. I apologize. Okay. Um, I would like to nominate uh, Eric Johnson. Uh, thank you. So we have a nomination for Mr. Johnson. Are there any other nominations? Uh, now we'll go ahead and close nominations, and uh, we'll go ahead and vote uh, on uh, the, the two nominees. First, we'll uh, seek votes for uh, Commissioner uh, Pat Kemp. Me. There's one vote for, uh, for count, uh, Commissioner Pat Kemp. Um, now we'll go to uh, Board Member Johnson. Are there any votes for Board Member Johnson? One, two. And I don't know if, yeah, Director Williams, can you hear? I don't know that we have Director Williams on, on the phone right now. So, well, I mean, we have, uh, we have a quorum and we're prepared to proceed forward without Director Williams. So we could go ahead and take a vote right now on chair um, uh, on, on Mr. Johnson as uh, receiving the most votes for chair and see if there is a full present vote for Mr. Johnson as chair or we can wait till Ms. Williams comes to the hearing. Well, because she checked in, I'd rather wait for Ms. Williams. Director Williams, are you able to provide a vote? We, we have lost uh, Director Williams on the CMT. How would you like to proceed forward? Do you want to proceed forward to the vote? We have a quorum. We, we can legally proceed forward, or alternatively, you can make the decision to wait, and we can move on to the next agenda item and wait for her appearance. Has, has Ms. Williams indicated that she's going to be here in person, or she's just running behind? Or Yes, she has indicated she will be here physically. She is just running late, um, and that's why she started her participation via the phone. Oh. But as far as moving forward with the other items of the agenda, we would have to have Ms. Mandel run the meeting until then. That would we don't be, have a chair. Well, the, or <laughs> well, that would be correct. I would need to be able to run the meeting. However, I'm going to have to be stepping out for the presentations as it relates to um, the lobbying services. So it would be Ms. Brenda Bailey who would be serving in my capacity during that time. Or, I mean, I'm chair right now until we have someone else. Um, so I could see where we could wait for Ms. Williams. 
and I could just move forward with the other items. We, we can proceed in that fashion given that, that Ms. Kemp is currently the chair. That, that is fine. Um, I just would uh, make the recommendation that we proceed forward in some form or fashion either to take the vote or to proceed forward um, with Ms. Kemp as, uh, as chairwoman, I'm sorry, <laughs> with uh, Commissioner Kemp as the, the chair, but I do need to step out uh, for the next item. I'd be fine with uh, waiting until Ms. Williams uh, arrives. Uh, we have a lot of people uh, who are here to be able to talk, and we got a lot of things to do today. So I say we just go ahead and let Commissioner Kemp chair the meeting until Ms. Williams arrives. Then we have the election, and we can move forward. Thank you. We don't need an action on that. That's how we can proceed forward. And at this time, I'm going to turn the general counsel services over to Ms. Bailey, and I will be stepping off the dice. Thank you. Yeah, I think the first thing before we do that is uh, approval of the minutes for March 20th, 2023. Do Motion we... to approve. Second. Okay, and all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, seeing none, we can now move to the presentation with Ms. Brenda Bailey, Heart Director of Legal Services. She'll share with the committee the flow of the process for the presentations and facilitate the process. Um, Ms. Bailey, uh, you're recognized. Ms. Furr, legal, proceeding on legal. Thank you. Good morning, committee members, Mr. Drainville. At this time, you will hear the presentation. Hold on one sec. I don't know where we're getting the additional. Okay, go ahead. All right, so at this time, you will hear the presentations from the top firms who would have submitted bids for um, proposals for legislat legislative services for three disciplines being federal, state, and regional. Each firm will have seven minutes per discipline to present before you this morning. Gray Robinson submitted a um, proposal for all three disciplines. Holland and Knight submitted a proposal for two disciplines and Shoemaker submitted a proposal for one discipline. As a result, Gray Robinson will have 21 uninterrupted minutes. Um, Holland and Knight will have 14 uninterrupted minutes to present before you and Shoemaker will have seven minutes for the regional legislative services presentation. At the time of the presentation, we ask that only members of the firms presenting remain in the room. The other firms, whether virtual or otherwise, will be asked to step out of the room or log off of WebEx. Um, and after the presentations have been conducted and concluded, the committee will have an opportunity to ask for questions or, you know, issue any comments. Um, thereafter, after all receiving all of the presentations, the um, a member of the HART staff will discuss the, the pricing sheet that was provided to you this morning um, to, so that you can facilitate a discussion as it relates to the, the firm that would add the, the most value with respect to the presentation. Um, any questions with respect to this process? I'm sorry? No. Okay. I, we will make sure that we get that to you before we start. Okay. Um, while we do that, the first firm to present. Uh, can I ask one more question? Yes, Sir, with the presentations, are you going to have it um, be like, I know you have th uh, three, two, and one. Like, will everybody present the federal at first in one thing and then the state and then the local? How will that go? No. Um, Gray Robinson submitted for all three, so right. they'll have 21 minutes and they'll do an uninterrupted three minutes. They'll have an opportunity to present their proposal with respect to federal, state, and regional. Thereafter, you'll hear from Holland and Knight. They only submitted for federal and state. They will have 14 minutes. And after that, you'll hear from Shoemaker. They submitted for the regional proposal and thereafter, you, they will have seven minutes. Okay, so, and then we're getting the pricing sheets now, because I, as I understand too, the way the pricing was done, I guess, um, Holland and Knight, from what I understand, isn't, um, it, while the other firms are charging for uh, both what they do, Holland and Knight is, is doing the regional, it's just part of the package. It's even a different pricing package, is that? Let me see if anyone from staff can actually specify. Thank you. 
I, I think that's significant. Good morning, everyone. Angela Pay, Deputy Attorney here at Heart. To answer your question, Commissioner, Holland and I only submitted a proposal for both federal and state. While they may um, offer limited regional services, regional services is not included within their contract. So the pricing does not include that either. Okay. Um, okay, we can proceed. I guess then I'd like to know exactly what the regional services are. But okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Thank you. The first to present will be Gray Robinson. I understand that they are appearing virtually. They will have 21 minutes. Thank you. A part of the team, virtually, yes. So we have Larry. Okay. Hey, Blair and Doyle, real quick, we were just going to do a sound check to make sure. So can you all turn on your microphone and confirm for us? Absolutely, Chris. I can hear you fine. Confirming audio. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you all today on behalf of Gray Robinson. Uh, I'm Chris Dawson, and we look forward to presenting to you a collaborative, uh, team-based, and results-oriented approach for government relations for HART. Uh, with that, we're going to start with some quick introductions from our team, and we're going to start at the top uh, in our federal office with Doyle Bartlett and then Blair Hancock for introductions. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, uh, board. I'm sorry. apologize for not... Being able to be there in person, we had a family event that prevented me from traveling. My name is Doyle Bartlett. I've been with Drew Robinson for about four years. Prior to that, I spent 15 years in private lobbying practice with my own firm. Uh, and prior to that, I spent 10 years um, with Congressman Bill McCollum, the last five years as his chief of staff. And I lead the uh, federal office here for Gray Robinson in Washington. Blair? Yep, good morning. Um, I do apologize for not being there in person. I am from Tampa Bay, so always enjoy the opportunity to get home. Um, but thank you for allowing us in the DC office to join virtually. Um, Blair Hancock, I started my career in the governor's office in Tallahassee, now Senator Rick Scott up here in DC, uh, and then worked for uh, Economic Affairs, uh, State Legislature and Committee in Tallahassee then the University of Florida doing their government relations and then federal relations, and then worked uh, in the previous administration doing congressional affairs for the Department of Housing and Urban Development and have since been with Gray Robinson. I think my skill set will be most helpful to heart in the intersection of the agency and congressional work. Um, we have two other colleagues that aren't with us today. One is uh, former Congressman uh, Tom Feeney, former Speaker of the Florida House, is part of our team, as well as Chris McConnell, who was um, Chief of Staff to Joe Crowley, uh, and spent about 10 years on Capitol Hill. So we've got both bipartisan uh, representation within our team, as well as former Congressman um, Tom Feeney. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Will. Continuing with the introductions will be Ryan Matthews from the state team, followed by Robert Stewart. Thank you, Chris. Ryan Matthews, pleasure to be with you all this morning. I have been with Gray Robinson for about two years now. Uh, for the seven years prior, I was in private practice with another firm uh, that was acquired by Gray Robinson. Really, the focus of that firm was uh, environmental matters, transportation matters, and local government matters. Uh, prior to private practice, I was with the state's Department of Environmental Protection, where I was the director of the Office of Water Policy, uh, deputy secretary for regulatory programs, and then under Governor Scott for about 11 months was secretary of that agency. 
Thanks. Good morning. Uh, Robert Stewart uh, with the uh, Gray Robinson office out of Orlando in Tallahassee. I've been with the firm for about 17 years. Um, primarily, uh, my, my focus is in representing clients before the legislature and the executive office of the governor, including a particular focus, uh, and you'll hear this throughout our presentation, of representing local government, quasi-governmental agencies, uh, and uh, pursuing their initiatives uh, in Tallahassee. So great to be with you today, and we'll be back in just a minute. All right, next from the uh, regional and local team, uh, Christopher Berg will introduce himself. Hello, my name is Christopher Berg with the Law Office of Gray Robinson. Uh, before joining the firm, I was a legislative aide at Tampa City Council for three years, first under Council Member Lisa Monteleone and then under Council Member Louis Vieira. Uh, after leaving the uh, Tampa City Council, I went to FSU Law where I was involved. I uh, worked for a local lobbying firm uh, on both local government and land use related matters and in my capacity as uh, in Gray Robinson, I'm both a local government attorney and local lobbyist. So my career has been involved uh, exclusively in the local government land use and policy realms. Thank you, everyone. And lastly, uh, Chris Dawson with the team, part of, uh, part of both the state and local uh, representation uh, proposed today. Uh, I am a 10-year attorney with the firm, uh, started out doing construction litigation and uh, for the, about the last nine and a half years have been doing exclusively lobbying and government relations. Uh, that includes a significant amount of work uh, with the state legislature on both appropriations items and with the executive branches of government on uh, grants and other funding initiatives. Uh, I do hold two degrees in civil engineering, so transportation is something that has been part of my life for quite a while and something I am very excited to uh, help uh, clients with in Tallahassee and locally. And uh, we look forward to giving the presentation today to let uh, Hart know what type of services we could provide uh, at all of these levels of government to the benefit of uh, your users and your organization. Uh, I'm going to invite Robert Stewart to talk a little bit about the history of the firm uh, and how we are uniquely quali uh, qualified in this response. Thank you, Chris, and good morning again. Uh, the next couple of slides, I'll just sort of breeze through them, but, but the, the, the purpose of those uh, as you're reviewing is to give you a sense of who we are as a firm. Um, our current CEO, former Speaker of the House, Dean Cannon, likes to say that Gray Robinson thrives at the intersection uh, of the law and politics. And there's really no place where local government exists more than that. Um, in fact, representing local government has been part of the firm's DNA literally since our founding. Uh, when Charlie Gray founded our firm in 1970, uh, we were, uh, he, he was at the time the city of Orlando city solicitor. Uh, and so being a part of local government, being in the fabric of our community, representing quasi-governmental entities such as HART, uh, has always been uh, a, a very integral part of who we are as a firm. Um, the, uh, that growth of our firm, now 14 offices all over the state of Florida and our 15th office in Washington, D.C., uh, has always been centered around finding places where we can be both civically, politically, uh, and community engaged. Um, that includes here in Tampa, where the second move out of Orlando from uh, Gray Robinson was into Tampa, the old Shackleford Farrier firm, and we've been rooted in the Tampa Bay area downtown uh, since, um, since the year 2000. Um, we are um, uh, established, obviously, as a partner with HART. Uh, our hope today in, in talking with you about our capabilities at the local, state, and federal levels is to grow that partnership. Uh, and, uh, and grow together with you uh, in, in serving your interest and taking your messages uh, to the halls of, of government. Uh, from a practice area, we're deeply rooted with FDOT. Um, we do a lot in the transit space. Uh, that includes uh, uh, understanding and knowledge of issues such as paratransit, uh, the transportation disadvantage trust funds, the things that you all deal with every single day with MPOs and DOT and local government. Uh, we are deeply rooted on those issues and have a great understanding of them. And so um, it, you can go to the next couple of slides. Um, you'll see just some of the things that we like to talk about, and that includes our community focus. Uh, Charlie Gray once said, when you build your community, you'll build your firm, and that's exactly how we've tried to serve and exactly how we've tried to grow. A few of the accolades that we're, that we're particularly proud of you see on the screen there, but uh, really the hope is, is to give you a sense that, that, that our firm, uh, we feel truly is uniquely qualified for this endeavor, uh, leveraging our local, state, and federal relationships and experiences to your benefit. And I think now I'm handing it off to Doyle uh, to talk more about our federal practice in particular. Great. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate, again, the opportunity to be with you all, at least virtually. Um, our focus on the federal side is really is, is find the, 
funding opportunities for local governments that provided by the federal government, both sort of in the reestablishment of uh, earmarks within Congress as well as the programmatic funding that comes through uh, the um, other parts of government. But our, the really sort of thing that we do is partner with our clients to really identify and target those areas of potential funding that allows us to go after them. And I was encouraged greatly by this description of both the sort of uh, what, you, what your sort of process is down for federal relations as well as sort of the deliverables that, the, uh, that HART is looking for because that's really what we help our clients do, which is identify those opportunities and then go after them successfully. I think we've been doing this for about the last four years since I joined the firm. We've had a number of successes. Uh, probably our biggest success was bringing Blair Hancock on board to help lead this effort with me to be able to identify these things. And, let me, before I hand it off to Blair, talk a little bit more about the specifics of what we're looking to do. Let me again emphasize the, the need for uh, extraordinarily good communications between your team and our team, and there, our need to sit and plan and, and target uh, these opportunities. One of the challenges with the federal government, I think as everyone knows, is just the size and the scale. And the way that we attack that size and the scale is to really sit down with our clients on an onboarding process, understand your needs and your priorities, and then begin to develop a plan that allows us to go off and execute on those. The one of the other challenges with DC, other than just the scale of it, is the time frames. And I always kind of have fun with our state colleagues that everything, they actually do things and do things in a short amount of time. We don't. We, we do things over a long period of time. Things take a long time in the congressional sessions. The sessions are two years. They last for the full two years. And then the government itself, as it begins to fund these projects, does it over a very long span of time. So the key to success here is twofold. One is the communications between us and our clients, which I think we're very proud of our ability to communicate fully. And secondly, our ability to target and identify those programs where those funding opportunities are or those other opportunities are, and to be able to put up together a plan and go execute on that plan as we go forward. Let me turn it over to Blair now and let her talk a little bit about some of the successes we've had over the last few years. Yes, and I know we're on limited time, so I'll kind of leave some of the successes up on the slide for you all to review. Uh, but there are two funding opportunities that we really want to highlight today. The first one being community project funding requests or federal earmarks, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, these are smaller dollar amounts. They average in the, about the $3 million range. Um, but they are direct earmarks um, made available through members of Congress. And the benefit there is that uh, there are multiple members of the Hillsborough delegation to target with each member limited to 15 requests every year. The process gets very competitive, but that's where uh, we come in, as Doyle mentioned, having that proactive uh, engagement throughout the year so that when that timeline does happen, um, we can be tremendously successful in that. So outlined a couple of those highlights on the slide and again in our RFQ. Um, but the other opportunity is those larger uh, grants made available through the executive agencies. Um, also through major packages of legislation. Uh, most recently we had the IIJA, the, the large infrastructure bill that you all will remember that had a tremendous amount of funding associated with it. The trouble there is that a lot of those funding opportunities are made available on a rolling basis that are hard to identify as those timelines uh, come out. So that's where we help our clients identify the opportunities that they are most uh, interested in or uh, in the best position for success in. Um, and we send out a monthly uh, federal grant opportunity alert, um, alerting our clients to the opportunities that are available uh, to them. Um, most recently, we helped the city of Tallahassee secure a $15 million raise grant through the Department of Transportation and a $20 million uh, grant, again, through the Department of Transportation for their bus and bus facilities programs. So we have a lot of successes to lean on in the appropriations front. Um, beyond that, I, I believe the next slide um, will showcase that outside of appropriations and, and securing funding, um, there's a lot of communication that takes place and troubleshooting. Um, the, we have great relationships, again, with the delegation and with the various agencies, 
and know who to connect with and when to connect with. And this is just one example of our success with the U.S. Travel Association um, in working with uh, the Secretary Blinken and members of Congress to resolve uh, various issues. And just in closing, I would add, that's really sort of the other key to this, is how do we leverage your relationship and the relationships with the local delegation to influence the outcomes in the federal government. And we spend a good bit of time partnered with um, your delegation members and, you know, driving those messages forward. So uh, I'll turn it back over to Chris. Fantastic. Thank you, Doyle and Blair. Uh, it's now my pleasure to talk a little bit about some of our state focus, uh, both on the appropriations side, and then I'll ask uh, Ryan Matthews and Robert Stewart to join me to talk about transportation policy as well. Uh, but much like uh, the federal practice, of course, we, we focus the state practice with both a local roots, and that includes working with your delegation, leaning upon our office here with decades of experience in Tampa Bay. Uh, and then, of course, having the reach of a statewide full-service firm uh, with 13 offices and essentially, we are, uh, as a firm, constituents to most legislat uh, legislators in the legislature. We know them when they run for candidates. Our, our attorneys and professionals grow with them in those relationships as they move up through the legislature. And we think that breadth and depth of uh, focus and of strong relationships across the state is really an asset that Gray Robinson brings forward uh, for heart. That includes, of course, transportation funding. And, and when it comes to those types of items, uh, appropriations issues at the state level, we are all hands on deck and we uh, turn over the couch cushions to find money, whether it's through a direct appropriation from the legislature, uh, working with your legislative delegation, or working through grants at uh, the Florida Department of Transportation and the Transit Office, whether it's working with Florida Commerce, which formerly was the Department of Economic Opportunity. Uh, any and everywhere we can look in Tallahassee, we want to work with your team to identify what the needs are and then go out and find those dollars with the legislature. And you can see some of the most uh, recent successes here from our team on the funding side. Uh, and happy to report the most recent $53 million uh, was for a transit project for Escambia County with their ECAT system. That was a re uh, rebuild Florida grant that they were just awarded last month. You can see, uh, again, uh, appropriations matters done on behalf of our clients across the state, and, and it goes back to those relationships. It's building out relationships with the local delegation to have them buy into hard and what the infrastructure needs are. And then it's going out around the state to meet with the decision makers, whether it's uh, Alex Andrade, who's the Transportation Appropriations Subcommittee Chair. He's from Pensacola, but you have to have that relationship to bring transportation dollars back to Tampa Bay. And with the breadth of our firm, uh, we are able to have those meeting relationships at all levels of uh, leadership in the legislature and the executive branch. Um, it's a two-sided coin, of course, in Tallahassee, and transportation policy is equally important. So I'm going to invite Ryan Matthews up to talk a little bit more about the firm's experience in this area. Thanks, Kristen. It's tough to sort of overstate the ability on the appropriation side to garner dollars for our clients. Again, overall, a billion dollars that have been achieved by Gray Robinson lobbyists. That's something we're very, attorneys and lobbyists, that's something we're very proud of. Let's talk a little bit about policy at the statewide level. Obviously, in 2023, there was robust transportation discussions in Tallahassee, I would assume, and, and certainly uh, expect that those will continue on during the 2024 legislative session. So locally, we've got a couple issues that we still have to deal with, right? Um, you're talking about the transportation surtax. Uh, the legislature last year, and obviously that $570 million that were collected from 2019 to 2021, uh, the legislature uh, contemplated allowing for different entities to provide projects uh, to both the House and Senate to ultimately fund that, pro that process. Now, that shifted course during, uh, during that, this last legislative session, really during those waning weeks, um, whereby the governor came in uh, and said perhaps we should have a sales tax holiday uh, with those funds. So we are still, it remains to be seen what the legislature's dedicated path is going to be for those dollars. Obviously, they are of great importance. Obviously, the, the local citizens have spoken in terms of transportation needs uh, and funding there too. So it will be very interesting in 2024 where we ultimately settle on that matter. We had a number of policies that directly affected Hart. 
uh, in House Bill 1397 by uh, uh, Senator Burgess and Representative Lawrence McClure, um, regional transportation planning um, is going to continue again to be a significant topic of discussion, uh, not only for regional transit authorities such as HART, but also for metropolitan planning organizations or MPOs. I've had the pleasure of representing Metro Plan Orlando for the last seven years. Uh, and quite frankly, in working with the House Transportation and Modal Subcommittee currently, which is chaired by Representative Fiona McFarland, there is a narrative or at least a philosophy right now that, that we may have too many MPOs in this state. Um, so you can see an effort uh, as we are working with that staff uh, in the chair during the summer um, at looking at a, a large substantive policy bill next year that potentially looks at consolidation of MPOs. What is the, the matter of mode and operation for those entities? Um, and policies don't stop there. Quite frankly, we have had the ability through our representation of metropolitan planning organizations to work on uh, potential mobility fee changes that are likely coming back in the 2024 session. Natural gas rebates. Uh, we have the pleasure of representing the Florida Municipal Natural Gas Association. So when you're talking about natural gas rebates, that's something we're going to be um, significantly focused on. Again, from a regional transit authority perspective with Tallahassee, that intra-agency coordination is of the utmost importance. And we do have the experience and the relationships both at FDOT uh, central office in Tallahassee at the district level as well, but then all of your transportation partners uh, included. And I think that's what's significantly important. Chris mentioned uh, appropriations. Again, we had a $15 billion transportation budget last year, $400 million for local transportation initiatives, uh, $62 million for that transportation disadvantage program, which we work on uh, significantly throughout the course of the session. I want Robert Stewart to talk very briefly about the local delegation relationships through the Aviation Authority as well. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. And just to, just to highlight that, uh, we have the privilege, and you've seen it in our RFQ response, of, uh, of representing uh, the Hillsborough County Aviation Authority, and we've done that now for six years, uh, including just uh, the session before last, uh, working on their local bill that reauthorized their Enabling Act, uh, a really important piece uh, of policy for them as they continue to grow, and obviously they're a major partner of HART. We also represent the school district, so we are very active in the Hillsborough area with your delegation meeting uh, on a very regular basis with members of, of the Hillsboro uh, delegation and the surrounding areas. Uh, so we look forward to bringing that to bear for you all as well. Thank you. And last, I'd like to bring up Chris Berg to talk a little bit about our regional and local experiences. Hello again, my name is Chris Berg. Uh, just to talk a little bit about our regional experience, um, I gave you a little bit about my background and I've been involved in Tampa politics policy and legal side for my entire professional career at this point. Um, just to give you a little bit of sense about who we represent in our background, uh, we represent on a local level clients such as the Sea Pace Alliance and Habitat for Humanity Hillsboro, uh, interfacing with uh, the City of Tampa elected officials and staff as well as Hillsboro County elected officials and staff. Uh, in the legal side, it very much mirrors what our experience is for the lobbying side where representing clients such as uh, Hillsborough County Public Schools interfacing with uh, municipalities in the region as well as the, uh, the airport authority on local zoning matters. And really that's, I think, what we bring um, from a regional perspective is our ability to work with local governments, our knowledge of the process, um, our relationships, and even where our relationships may overlap with those members on the board, we are able to interface on your behalf without having to run into any of these potential sunshine violations that uh, you might issue. Um, I'd like to turn it over as well to Chris Dawson, Ryan Matthews. Absolutely. We see our countdown ticking down. So we, we have been thrilled to bring you this presentation of uh, the various focuses of our firm. But I think really what the, the package comes down to is the ability to break down silos between uh, forms of government, whether it's federal, state, and local, break down silos even in the community. In that local perspective Chris talks about, I mean, it helps to drive Hart's priorities when the community is pushing Hart's priorities. And I think that that's what the Gray Robinson can team, uh, Gray Robinson team can bring to Hart. Uh, in a uh, team-oriented and results-based approach. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions. I got a quick question, Madam Chair. I'll, as far as the, on the uh, member projects that you were referring to in the, on the federal side, what was kind of a conversion rate that y'all had when it came to uh, bringing some of those dollars home versus, you know, just, you know, all the different applications that you submitted. 
Absolutely. Well, I'll give the state and uh, then I'll look to uh, Doyle to give the federal answer to that. Um, last year, we brought on home over a billion dollars for our clients out of about one point three billion in requests. Um, that was an approximately 80 percent success rate at the state level. Uh, Doyle, can I hand it to you for the federal numbers? Um, sure. And I, I'm going to brag on Blair here who leads us out for far. So I, right now, um, and this I'm not going to hold to this forever, but we're we're batting about 100 percent on CFP projects up here, uh, both last year and this year. We're really successful at getting the local members of the delegation to put those projects on their list and following those lists through the pro process. So we're doing extraordinarily well on that front. Okay. Doesn't look like, do we have any other questions? Thank you all. Thank you so much. At this time, we'll ask anyone appearing virtually on behalf of Gray Robinson, we ask that you please log off. All right, next up to present will be Holland and Knight. As stated before, they have 14 minutes to present a proposal with respect to the federal and state legislative services. I'm delighted to be here before you today and I want to thank you for the years that we've had an opportunity to serve you in Washington and Tallahassee. Our team really consists of very experienced people with a tremendous support from our back office for research, monitoring. Uh, our Washington office uh, is ranked number three in federal, federal legislation. Last year, they were selected as the number one firm dealing with public uh, transportation. In our Tallahassee environment, our office in Tallahassee has been there for some 72 years. We have major offices in every metropolitan area in the state of Florida to assist the Tallahassee office engage in its business. So I think we have a great team with a lot of capability, good, strong support from our back office on research, able to perform in a manner which I think will satisfy you. We've had a long history with transportation um, here in Hillsborough County. Knight Park of Holland uh, was one of the founders of Tampa Electric. Tampa Electric had the streetcar system. 
All the, when I was a youth, I used that streetcar system quite a bit. 33 years later, I got elected mayor of the city of Tampa. At that time, transit was a department of the city of Tampa. There was no authority. I worked with the county commission to activate the authority. I appointed the first members to the board. Went to referendum twice to get the millage tax that you use today. First time it failed, but I didn't give up. I went back and did it again. And the second time it passed in the city and it passed then in the county because they had to pass in two separate locations. The two cities, Plant City and Temple Terrace, opted not to be part of it. So we've had a long history serving public transportation here in Hillsborough County. We would certainly appreciate the continuance of that relationship. We think we performed for you. And I think that uh, you have made tremendous progress in moving this agency forward. It's not an easy job. I've been in government a long time, and I know it's not easy to do. But I think you've got the talent to do it. And I think we have the talent to support you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attention. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. I'm Lisa Barkovic. I'm one of your lead advocates for the federal portion of the contract in Washington, D.C. And as the governor just talked about, in terms of our expertise, we consider ourselves the leading transit policy expertise in Washington. If you look at this map here, with our partner, Jeff Booth and Booth Transit Consulting, we represent over two dozen transit agencies at the federal level and transit projects. So that's where we kind of kind of get into some of the nitty gritty on, on policy issues. And so we do consider ourselves to be at the forefront on transit policy, not only in Washington, but also with our team in Tallahassee. So currently, how we serve HART. We take our deep experience and our political know-how to serve HART through a variety of ways. So we advise and advocate on policy initiatives whether that would impact HART. Whether that's positive or negative, we're here to help walk you through those steps. We provide funding and grant strategy and advocacy. We advise on community project funding. And what that meant for HART in the last year, we helped secure $5 million for the Bus Stop Improvements Program by working closely with our Congresswoman Kathy Castor. We also support stakeholder engagement and relationship building with elected officials and agency staff. So how do we take you to the next level? We're in a part right now where we're building on the momentum that you already have. And so we do that through our team orientation, our bipartisanship, and profile raising successes. On grants and funding, right now we're in the process of working with the HART staff to submit a neighborhood access and equity grant application, which is due next month. And so we're working through those process. What is the right strategy? What is the selection criteria that the Department of Transportation is looking at? And we help work and put all that together. So we're crafting the applications along with your staff. We are soliciting support letters. We're drafting them, getting into the nitty gritty. And if we're not successful, sometimes because these programs are very oversubscribed, we're then working to get the debriefs to make sure that we're successful the next time and putting that timeline together. And we're already doing this now. We have a lot of momentum that's going forward. And we think as we work through this fall, we're already five steps ahead of everybody else in doing this. And we had some great DC visits this past summer to already start laying that foundation in the groundwork. So we let our six federal successes define us. We have secured billions of dollars for our clients through both community project funding and through the federal grant process. What does that mean? I'll give you a couple examples. In 2000, and since 2009, the inception of the Tiger Grant Program, which then became Build and then which became Raise, we have secured almost a billion dollars in grants for our clients. In Tampa alone, we helped the city get the money for the Riverwalk in 2012. And then we just recently helped them get the money, $24 million, for their build grant to do the west side of the river walk. We've also helped our clients secure millions of dollars in bus and bus facilities, low known emissions, transit oriented development. We are working hand in hand to get you guys to get that money. This snapshot is just a snapshot of the just past couple of years where we've helped Hart get money. And we think we're in a good spot now to kind of continue to build on that momentum and get you ready for success in 2024. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kim Case, 
who's another senior policy advisor in our Tallahassee office, and she works on the state issues. Thanks, Lisa. I'm Kimberly Case, and Mark Delegal and I have had the privilege of representing you in Tallahassee for the past five years. Today, I'd like to highlight four issues where we've been able to use our policy expertise, our legislative experience, and our strategic advice to help HART reach their policy and fiscal needs. First, after the brutal attack on and murder of HART bus driver Thomas Dunn in 2019, HART wanted to take immediate action to enhance the public safety of drivers. Mark and I helped craft legislation, secured sponsors, promoted, uh, we also did press conferences, and we promoted a legislation that enhanced criminal penalties. It also encouraged protective barriers for drivers and required de-escalation training. As a result of the committee testimony and the influence that we were able to have with that bill, while the bill ultimately did not pass because of fiscal concerns, it brought the issue to the forefront, which was the objective. And as a result of those efforts and the statewide exposure that we were able to get for that issue, today industry standards for buses include protective barriers for drivers as well as enhanced de-escalation training. Hart led the charge on that and we were proud to be part of the effort. Second, we're all aware that the heavy maintenance facility can no longer adequately service the fleet. A new facility is needed. With limited state funding opportunities, we were asked by Hart's CEO in 2021 to try to provide a strategy for alternative sources of funding. We've discussed that and shared with um, that information with FDOT, both here at the local level as well as Tallahassee, and we were able to identify some funds that could be reprioritized and had flexibility so that some of those dollars could go to start, to start the process. We've also identified several competitive state grants that we think Hart should consider exploring. This effort is ongoing. As a matter of fact, this afternoon at 1 p.m., we'll be meeting with HART staff to have further discussions on what we can do at the state and federal level to assist with the new heavy maintenance facility. Third, for the last few years, legislators have explored the idea of increasing the caps on sovereign immunity. One of the bills last session would have increased those caps per incident from 200,000 to 2.5 million and from 300,000 to five million per incident. This dramatic increase would have posed significant threat and exposure to heart, so we worked closely with other stakeholders, including the Florida Association of Counties, to raise concerns and were successful in our efforts. The fourth and final issue I'd like to mention is our advocate, advocacy efforts this past session when a transportation bill was filed by Representative McClure and Senator Burgess. That bill originally directed FDOT to conduct a study that would have studied the merger or dissolution of heart. We were able to work closely with Chair Vieira and have meaningful discussions with the bill sponsors, legislative leaders, and other committee members. And as a result of our efforts, the bill was amended and included expanded scope language that we'd requested that looks at the study not solely as a study on a merger or dissolution, but rather looking at ways to transform heart and ways to enhance your services. We fully expect a bill to be filed that implements whatever recommendations come out of FDOT, and we are currently arranging meetings with the interim CEO, Drainville, last year's bill sponsors, as well as other delegation members. While there are many examples that where we've successfully interacted with state government on behalf of HART, these four examples demonstrate our proactive and creative approach to tackling problems and finding solutions and we'd like to continue that partnership with you. We'll close our presentation with remarks from my colleague, Jim Davis. Jim? Thanks, Kim, good morning. Um, some of you all I know, some of you I don't, so I'll just start by telling you I'm a former state representative and a former member of Congress from Tampa. I've worked um, with HART for many years. Um, thanks for the chance to be here this morning. Last time we were here was about three years ago. Uh, when we were there, we promised you all results. Uh, as Kim just mentioned, we've had some excellent results on the state level and the federal level. I think my math suggested that Lisa and our team in Washington, of which I'm a part, provide about $10 million for HART. So this is really about keeping the promises we made to you, and we will make those again today to ultimately produce results and to slog through 
the process in both Tallahassee and Washington, D.C. Um, Governor Martinez provides the political insight and help in Tallahassee. I do the same in Washington. Sometimes these issues intersect, and we're there to make sure that we can deal with the intersection of both federal and state issues. Um, many of us have a history with HART. Governor Martinez mentioned his. I think I helped fund this building. It looks great. <laughs> but it's not about yesterday. It's not even about today. It's about tomorrow. Many of us live here. And we are acutely aware of how important funding is for HART right now. It's important to the future of our city. It's important to the future of our economy. It's important to the future of our workers and our citizens. And we are committed, as we have been, to continue to provide a clear and consistent voice in both Tallahassee and Washington, D.C. to help HART not just get through the turbulence, but also to succeed and prosper as the rest of the city and the region has. So thanks for the chance to be here and to present our team to you. Okay, thank you for that. Do we have um, any questions? Okay, I'll just say for now, <laughs> Governor Martinez, I've been trying to get that history exactly as you said it for so long. I've asked uh, so many people, and I was... Uh, it was so succinct, and um, I'm going to have to, like, set up a time to... Okay, can I spend time with you and give you a history? There was a, a tough battle to pass, but uh, it passed in the city of Tampa both times. I've asked a lot of people. Yeah, and, but the county did not pass it the first time. And it was a special election. Mm -hmm. Then we went to a general election, and it passed in both the city and county. And, uh, I think we need to get that written down somewhere, just... Uh, <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Um, but um, I, I'll, I don't know if there's any other comments at this time. I just I did want to um, go ahead. Uh, just to follow up on what you asked before we started the presentations, um, because this go around, we did have a regional legislative component that um, you all did not submit an application for. Do your services include any regional, I guess, activities, or did you not submit an application on it intentionally? So, yeah, we, we currently do regional services. We still think of us as providing regional services. Like I said, we're working on a grant application right now. And I can tell you my list of getting support letters from other, you know, departments and agencies within the city, as well as we're working with our state team to get letters of support from the state. So we do the regional work, too. Why um, not but submit an application then? Or, or because we just feel like that's already, already encompassed of what we do holistically. So... I don't. So that, and that is what, you know, I understood mm -hmm. when I asked about this prior. So I'm glad you asked that. Um, and so I, I wanted to understand because that changes the pricing a lot and um, the impacts. And I've, um, you know. I, well, I can tell you I'm on the committee. And so the reason we added that, because I'm looking at, and we can talk about this after the presentations, but the reason we added that, I think, because the staff, did not feel like perhaps they were getting regional services and needed it. And so that's why I'm asking, if it is encompassed, but there was no response to the RFP, how do we know what portions? Because the RFP was crafted for what staff feels they need. Um, so if there's no RFP response to it, I think it's hard to determine which of those categories are being provided by your lobbying group on the regional level. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Delegal, and I'm part of the team and have been honored to represent you since 2018, along with Kim and Governor Martinez at the state level. So to explain our involvement, we have actually had a number of involvements with the local um, uh, party. So by way of example, we have interfaced at the, with the local DOT regional office, Ming, uh, on, on issues that affect the heavy maintenance facility. We've, we thought that was part of our responsibilities. In addition to that, we interfaced with the county um, on issues where we felt like that was part of our responsibility to get things rolling, uh, whether it be on the surtax um, uh, legislation that pops up from time to time in Tallahassee or also on funding for the heavy maintenance facility. What we have probably not done because of kind of our view is on this uh, authority, it, our members of the city's uh, city and members of the county. So to that extent, um, you know, we felt like we would assist and be a, a vessel, um, but not necessarily lobby the city because we felt as if you, uh, 
commissioner were already uh, on the city council, so you didn't you didn't didn't need us to lobby you or vice versa, vice was similar with the county commission. So maybe that's a distinction. But we feel that if there's any need locally, I mean, uh, Mr. Johnson and I have talked about issues uh, where on the heavy maintenance facility, and uh, Kim and I and, and, and Eric um, on as to uh, how Hillsboro Community College was going to participate as a workforce training facility at the heavy maintenance facility. So. Um, we're happy to continue doing that. We intend to continue doing that, but we just we're not uh, seeing uh, ourselves as lobbying. For example, the county commission, the city commission. So, and, and to some extent, I just it just seems like this. It is an extension of the same because it all it involves the state DOT and the. Um, uh, you know, the uh, statutory considerations, legislative considerations so often that I, I'm i not sure how to um, tease this out, but I'm just, um, you know, wondering as a matter of um, contracting if we were to do that. And there's, I, I don't know how the committee, I wasn't on the committee, so I'm not sure how they came up with that um, thought of this separate distinctive um, Section which I had not seen before and am not familiar with in the past, but kind of understood it more in the way that it was just explained rather than a separate entity. So I don't know, maybe that's um, something as well uh, that we can discuss because it would seem as though you could, you know, extend the projects that way or just just as it's been because it's it just seems like it is um, uh, a natural extent. Uh, extension of the state work to me um, so often, or primarily, actually. Just so we don't hold up the, the other teams for their presentations, I think we can, and we can even hear from staff that specifically requested that these services are mm -hmm. be encompassed, um, unless you, director, okay. 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 Thank you all for um, joining us, and we'll be in, I'll be in touch with you, Governor Martinez. <laughs> we will leave some time to have discussion of all three of them. Yes, definitely. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. All right, um, at this time, you will hear from Shoemaker um, with respect to their proposal for regional legislative services. Their presentation should only take no more than seven minutes. I turned on. Good morning. How are you? Good to see you all. Thank you um, for inviting us to be here. I am Sandy Merman with Shoemaker Advisors, and my colleague J.D. White will also be presenting part of this presentation. Um, is there is a seven-minute thing? I know you're adhering to it. You got it on your car. Okay. Um, I uh, we're again delighted to be here. Um, our working team is course, myself, J.D. White, and Les Miller, and in your packet today, you'll see uh, something from Les. Um, he could not be here. He is the host for the Shriners Convention that opened this morning in downtown Tampa, 
and um, was not unable to be here, but he did give you a quote there, and I hope you'll read it. He feels like, um, you know, he was chair of this board for two years. Um, he and I both served on this board, um, went through three CEOs, transition period, so he has a lot of experience. Um, so we've gotten through the working team, and I think uh, next is, Oh, who uh, Shoemaker Advisors is, is you can see is a big growing team uh, here in the local area. We and state, and we also do federal. Um, we have combined experience of over 102 years of public service with the people on our team. So we are a mile wide and a mile deep in experience and expertise, and I think that. Um, and I hope you all will consider um, a separate team for your regional because I think it's good given our depth and breadth of experience. Uh, what we do uh, specifically is, you know, all, all firms will tell you basically the same thing. They're going to advise you. Um, they're going to support your agenda. They're going to be help you with your long and ter short term strategic plans. Uh, we're going to, with our uh, broad network here in this community, we will give you a lot of connectivity and give you access um, to many, many organizations um, that we are affiliated with in the region. Um, of course, we have you know the Hillsborough County Board of Commissioners. The uh, City of Tampa, Pasco County, Pinellas County, Board. I mean, we're just extremely regional. Uh, we have, um, you know, the Tampa Bay Partnership. Uh, Ron Cristaldi, our managing partner, is actually the uh, incoming chair to the EDC. He's a former past chair of the Tampa Bay Chamber. So he's, um, you know, we have tons of connectivity uh, in the region. Thank you. Good morning, uh, J.D. White, Principal at Shoemaker Advisors, and uh, given the time, I'm just going to go quickly through some slides, but um, hit, you'll see it on the screen, but just hit the highlights. Um, I've been in, in and out of government for 25 years, um, I worked on the House Appropriations Committee in, uh, for Transportation in Congress, and was uh, part of the All for Transportation effort here a few years ago. So have uh, been working around transit and transportation for, for many years. Um, our strategic approach, uh, most firms will, um, will tell you that they, they, they need to get to know you, and, and we'll do the same thing. We're going to have a deep dive into your local priorities. Um, funding, we know, uh, is a priority for this agency to be effective and, uh, and continue to grow. Um, but we need to build coalitions, we believe. So we'd be part of not only talking to elected officials, but uh, stakeholders in the community, uh, building partnerships and um, changing public perception, uh, creating goodwill. And I think that's important as we uh, look at your representation. Board members can't be everywhere in the community. You have day jobs, you have families, even senior leadership really have are putting out fires and are worried about operations. You need a firm that will represent you in the community. Sandy mentioned um, we have plenty of reach, not only from uh, here in Hillsborough, but all the mayors in Pinellas as we talk about combining with PSTA, as we talk about Brightline coming in and how do we connect with Brightline. Uh, there's all kinds of opportunities and challenges that present itself for this organization, and you need someone with the depth and experience. No other firm has two former board members of heart that are working for you as your working team. Um, and then uh, lastly, I think I'm coming up to time. Um, so building a strategy is one thing, and communicating a strategy is another. We all know that pre-execution and execution of a strategy relies on very effective communication to the public. You have to build trust. You have to build trust with lawmakers, 
policymakers, and people that are surround you, employees. So part of our expertise is in communication. <coughs> we will endeavor to help you communicate with uh, all audiences, review your materials, work simultaneously with your internal teams, and make sure that it gets communicated out to the rest of the uh, rest of the community in an effective way. Um, and finally, um, you know, we have proven success. We have a lot of connections, a lot of clients, and those clients will become helper, helpers for this organization. They will become um, your eyes and ears. We will create connections and coalitions that you might not other, otherwise find. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions if you have it. Any questions? Okay, seeing none. No. No. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. So that concluded the presentations for um, today, but before we proceed into the discussion, um, as well as the action item, we ask that um, the Director of Procurement and Contract Services approach and discuss the pricing sheets that you would have received this morning. Thank you. Good morning, committee members. Scott Drainville. Um, this solicitation was a best value solicitation, our best value procurement. So as such, all proposals have been technically evaluated by the ad hoc committee. And pricing is one of the components to be evaluated and brought alongside of the technical evaluation um, of the proposals in order to make the necessary trade-off decisions as to which proposal represents the best overall value to the authority. Staff has prepared and provided a price analysis so the committee has the full picture of the impact on Hart's budget for the term of the contracts to make their decision or recommendation. So for federal, Gray Robinson is the lower, lowest in price, but not the highest in technical. The question the board must determine is if they are the best value. Holland and Knight is the highest technical. Can, did but, you? Yes. Just one minute. So you said, oh, you're saying for federal. Yes, Sorry. this is for Thank federal. Mm -hmm. Holland and Knight is the highest technical, but is 13% higher in price. The question the committee must determine is, are they the best value? For state, Gray Robinson and Holland and Knight are the same price, but Gray Robinson's technical score was slightly higher. For regional, um, the di this discipline is an added component that is currently part of the state legislative discipline in Hart's current legislative con contract. From budgeta budgetary perspective, this is an additional 48000 to 54000 a year expense for Hart, depending on the firm selected to be the best value. So today the committee must consider two options. A, select the top firm in each discipline and form a recommendation for Hart's Board of Directors, or the committee today may consider B, taking into consideration as the best value for Hart to extend the current contract with Holland and Knight and recommend the Hart Board of extending the current contracts for federal and state legislative services for up to two one-year options that are available as the best value, having an annual cost 32% below the technical proposals received for the solicitation. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Anybody, did anybody, I'm sorry, did anybody have any questions? I, I have a few questions. Um, the first question I had was we, we had another document prior to this one. What was the difference between this document and the previous one? The previous one, we went out with the, um, those in competitive range and requested a BAFO. So what you have, the, 
the second time is the best and final offer. Okay. From those in the competitive range. I think the technical scores were a little different as well. Um, I think they had Hall and Knight as the higher technical scores. And when I left, when we left the committee, that wasn't the case. Um, I, the technical scores were as they were on this newer sheet. Yeah, I can tell you that staff's looking at that right now. We had, um, I'm looking at the two, um, this is in state, right? Yes. Yes, in state. We had Gray Robinson and Holland and Knight both the same price, and we had Gray Robinson at 88.33 and Holland and Knight at 88.67. I'm not sure what flipped the technical to Gray Robinson going to 90.33 and Gray Robinson staying, I mean, Holland and Knight staying at the 88.67. But um, prior to the best and final, they was they was very close. Just from what I recall during the committee meeting, um, we all had submitted initial scores, and then scores changed during the discussion of the committee meeting. Um, so that's why I think these scores, um, the original scores may have been what they were, and then by the end of the committee meeting, some of the committee members had changed based on the discussion that was had um, during the committee. I just, I just recall when That's we correct. left, mm -hmm. one company did not have all of the highest scores. So Holland and Knight did not have all of the highest scores by the time the committee meeting had ended. So we're 100% sure that this document is right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And Chair, may I go continue? Yes. Um, how, I think we said Holland and Knight already has the contract, and they provide, if we were to remain with them, they would be the best value. They could be ter determined to be the best value um, if you know, the regional component was not, um, as discussed, was not submitted in, in their offer. Um, however, they, they cover, they've done some, some regional um, work as well. So is that a statement made with the understanding that we would not select a regional um, legislative service and and would expect Holland and Knight to continue the services they provide today and maintain their e extension or option to extend one additional year correct under the current contract terms and conditions okay yes. because that's why I was trying to understand 390 and 240 is more than Gray Robinson so the you are adding all three of Gray Robinson's in comparison to the two the federal legislation and the state legislation. The top technicals, yes. Okay. I'm saying, okay, I, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> thank you. Uh -huh. Member Schisler, did you? Yes. Yes, thank you. What, what was the rationale between breaking out the regional based upon the presentations or for, for soliciting mm -hmm. for the regional, based upon the presentations, it seems the Holland and Knight was already working on a regional level, um, although maybe not as, as, as myopically focused as, as, as Shoemaker might be, but what was the logic behind requesting the additional um, focus on the regional? I can first take a step at that and then you can respond. Um, we had an initial committee meeting about where we felt services we're lacking what we needed to do better, how we could do better. Um, and and part of staff from Hart is on that committee. I'm the only board member on that committee. That's one of the reasons. I know we talked about, you know, we do have the city of Tampa and the Hillsborough County Commission represented on this board. We don't have all regional organizations that are represented on this board. And so I think staff felt as though we don't have separate representation, particularly when we're talking about merger with PTSA, that's represented here and so whatever services Holland and Knight is providing, I have to assume the staff felt that they didn't have a representative to be able to lobby in that regard. Quick so, question. and we can hear from staff if we want Quick to question. address whether we feel those were, were being met by the needs of the staff, but that's where it came from, just having a conversation with staff about where they feel like they need additional services that were not being met. Okay, I am a little concerned that it seemed like it would have been easy for Holland and Knight to have responded to the RFP with zero additional services saying we meet what's here in the criteria. So I'm a little baffled why they wouldn't just do that. That's a good point. Thank you. Um, 
Quick question on the composition of the ad hoc committee. Can you refresh my memory on who was on the committee other than you, Rena? Or you can leave. Yes, yes. Um, we had um, internal staff. We had. Um, can you be a little bit more specific? Oh, sorry. Are you going to list the internal staff? Yeah, we can. Okay, sorry. I was just trying to figure out who was actually on the committee. Yeah, we had um, Lena Pettit and Angela. Was there anyone else? No, that was it. We had two two internal folks. Uh, so there was a staff of three? That was a committee of three? Committee of three, correct. Okay. See, I, I'm curious as to whether or not that might have been part of the issue as far as trying to figure out the, you know, what who was actually doing stuff on the regional side versus the state side because I think, you know, as we kind of talked, you know, during the actual presentation, you know, Commissioner Kemp had made a comment to where it's almost implied that the state part and the regional part are one and the same. And, and that's certainly, you know, my day job, you know, that's something that I think is almost, it, it is implied, you know, the state and regional. Maybe that's just where the committee didn't have the experience on that to be able to realize that that is how that works. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested, or I don't want to say the word baffled, but I'm certainly interested in the fact that there was a regional breakout because I think that really is causing a lot more confusion right. uh, than, than needed. I'll, I'll just, I haven't said anything yet, but I mean, I've been through these before. I've never seen some kind of yeah, regional breakout. Do. I think it would be unwise actually um, myself. And uh, I know that, it, I mean, that was not necessarily, I mean, I have experience with every committee in the region. Um, you know, I'm on TBARD, I'm on the, um, the uh, TMA, um, it, which is the three counties. I'm on, you know, the county commission. I've been uh, through this a lot, and I think it would be um, very unwise to have, actually, it would not be, it would not be, um, I, I, I would have never included a third element like this. And um, I, I would just like to put that out, but putting that out, um, it does really enhance, you know, the offer of Holland and Knight because you're having them do those services. And frankly, I'm pretty familiar, like, with the Holland and Knight people working with them both in Washington and locally and know them um, and can call them. And um, they, uh, as as they said when they came in here, like <laughs> a lot of them live here. You know, we know them from um, s local service, and so um, I was just confused by by that um, suggestion. So before we discount, though, can we hear from if staff? I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if anybody wants to speak about maybe their experience with whether we're getting the regional services, or do we want to hear? I mean, I want to give the opportunity, but if not. <laughs> I would I like to, if I, if I may, uh, just ask staff whether uh, the regional concerns was ever brought up in the, under the current contract and, and actually talked to the current contractor about if there was these issues or not. And part of what we may be experiencing here is that I know there's been turmoil for the past right. period of time, and I'm not sure that because one issue we had was who is the lobbyist reporting to? Um, and has that person changed over the course of time given, you know, what we've been experiencing with um, our previous CEO? But um, I think you have been reporting to someone within the organization, so um, we'd like, by the way, if they don't, if we don't want to hear anything from you. <laughs> What are we doing? Wait, what are we doing, guys? Good, good morning again. I'm sorry. Hey, hold on. Hold on just a second. Wait, I just, sorry. Have, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. That's okay. I don't understand. What are we, um, why are we bringing people back in at this time? Oh, did, are, is, are they, uh, I just have a question. Can they be in here for that discussion? They or? can. They can be. Okay. 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 Then it's okay. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure. I just didn't know what the process was in terms, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, I guess anyone can. This point. Um, well, I guess we could ask about that. Um, you're, the, you're the chair. Okay. In the chair. <laughs> I, you know what? It might be more comfortable to have the discussion without if we could do that. Yes. I think that's, that's Sorry correct, about that. that Sorry. We're discussing a current contract. 
I know. I just wondered in terms of a public meeting, but I mean, they can watch it. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what I was. That was my concern too. Um, but uh, if if that's all right. Um, okay. So to facilitate this discussion, we have provided for you the um, scope of work that was um, crafted with respect to this um, proposal, with respect to these proposals for federal. Um, state as well as um, the regional aspect. I do want to invite um, the deputy attorney, Ms. Pay, up here to discuss um, the needs, heart's needs with respect to our current services and what we could benefit from. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. To address some of your concerns in regards to regional services, I know that the, the Heart Ad Hoc Committee did have an opportunity to meet and we did decide that it was probably best to break out regional services from federal and state for the following reasons. One, we, it is a, it's definitely a knowledge that HARP's board has a number of county commissioners as well as city councilmen sitting on this board. However, there are certain key players that may be at TPO um, that HARP has a direct um, effect when certain policies come out of TPO that may affect HARP. Something specifically that recently came up in regards to the transportation tax and property tax and how those funds were going to be spent and recommendations that were made to the governor accordingly. It is Hart's opinion that we would like to have an individual who proactively um, lobby in favor of Hart's interests, both for funding as well as seeking local partnerships in these particular areas. For example, I know that the county commissioner's office right now is having a big discussion in regards to the ferry. Heart is uh, a big partnership in that particular venue, and we like to continue to partner with local um, agencies in the area to um, seek funding for different projects and venues. I just seemed as if it would be better to have someone at the regional level who was lived in this community, who did not reside, whether that be in Washington, D.C., or Tallahassee, who was a part of the Hillsborough County and surrounding areas community, being able to lobby on behalf of Hart and Hart's customers in, that, in those particular parts. Okay. Additionally, in regards to a potential MPO that may be formed, it's my understanding that the TPO was discussing that as well. Those kind of conversations are not taking place, at least currently, with legislative services, who I do have the honor and privilege of meeting with every single week. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, and I, I, I will just say, and with, with all, I mean, I just have been on these committees. I've been engaged in this, um, uh, and um, you know, the the committee was. Uh, I didn't realize. That I'm glad to find out the composition. I mean, uh, with all due respect to your judgment on these, we do. Uh, have you're fairly new to this um, community and to the the structures and things like that, but um, I w I would just say that I just don't I think uh, I think uh, Director Johnson and I have a lot of experience and I mean I think we very much uh, from what I heard from um, Director Johnson I just feel like this we should right away just eliminate this as uh, one of our concerns because I think this is just an area of confusion and it wasn't expected. I think before we did this, it should have been brought back to the board as a whole to talk about in terms of the scope of this. I may, you know, as because this is a rather huge change um, and I just don't, um, and I do think that there has been turmoil and confusion, um, even things like there, like, I know there was a suggestion of the merger even, but for instance, that, uh, you know, um, PSTA has publicly stated and they're out of the bill saying they don't want to do anything like that. So I just think this is, this would be very, um, to me, unwise to separate our state legislative uh, representation from our local representation and to have a separate category like that. I would, I mean, I, if someone would want to make a, um, a motion to um, to that effect uh, and further discussion, um, you know, I would certainly be open to supporting it. 
I think you had a question. Well, I, I was more got to just kind of piggyback on the comments. Uh, I didn't know what if we necessarily need to have a motion to be able to remove the regional part. I'm certainly not going to support the regional part. Uh, unfortunately, I think it actually put um, Shoemaker at a disadvantage. I think yes. I would have rather to have seen them come in at with the ability to be able to do a state and local because I, that's what I view regional as. You know, as I mentioned before, I think that you know Shoemaker would have probably been able to bring a a, a good proposal uh, for us to be able to consider. Uh, I just don't think that um, the way this is currently structured is going to work. It's going to create a too many cooks in the kitchen scenario. Uh, to me, if we were to be able to bring uh, somebody in, and again, I think they would have actually brought a lot of uh, expertise in there, as they uh, mentioned in the um, presentation. But I think this is where, and uh, Director Williams kind of touched on this, uh, or I'm actually, I'm sorry, it was uh, Director Frazier. Uh, with the previous leadership within the organization, uh, that's something that should have been uh, that that should have been directed toward Holland and Knight, I believe, because of how the a state and local regional relationship should work. So I think that um, that was a failure upon the previous CEO. And I know that I've had conversations with Mr. Drainville privately about how I believe that this is something that he is going to be responsible for in his interim capacity. And then as the new CEO was brought on, that is going to be something that they have to be able to look at and be definitely laser focused on with some of the issues that we have. Um, so back to the actual presentation, I'm, I'm sorry uh, on that, but I think that we, I don't know if we need a motion on that. I'm certainly not going to support any type of a regional uh, area right now. And I think we also, when we're considering what we're talking about right now, when we are talking about the, you know, the, the best value, we do need to probably have more of a conversation regarding that one year option uh, right now that's on the uh, books. Cause I think that's going to be something we're going to have to look at uh, very, very carefully. Commissioner Kemp, yes. um, I, I just, the reason why I wanted to have further conversation before the, and everyone entered the room is because there's going to be a clear disadvantage, as you said, Director Johnson, on the on Shoemaker adv Advisors. They came in with one perspective, and then we are moving the ball, so to speak. And so I just wanted to clarify, and, and as we make our decision, whatever it may be, we just may have to call out and specify what, what has happened at this point. Uh, and I, I, this would be a very unwise time to do this as we're uh, with in interim. I think we need to have more experience with that. And I think, you know, that, um, that uh, I, I just think this brings a lot of confusion to it. Um, Can I make one, one comment? Yes. Shoemaker did submit for state. They just didn't score as high as what you see I on see. the score. Yes, oh, they did submit okay. for state. That's um, right. I've, I yeah, saw it on the first one. Yeah, you're seeing the top one. score getter. So they did yeah. submit for state and regional. Um, but they scored the they highest top on the three. regional. They weren't okay. in the top two. I've got it. That's mm -hmm. good. Thank you for making that point. And perhaps, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and I will take responsibility for as the board member that was on this committee. Um, I just disagreed with the approach that you're taking, but I obviously don't have as much lobbying experience as you did. So with the, you know, how we've proceeded in this, we can discuss that. I do want to make sure that we are hearing what staff is saying in regards to feeling as if they need more representation regionally. So whether we have members on this board that are able to provide those types of services to work with staff or whether our current contractor, if they win this again, is doing that, there is something that's lacking there that they feel needs to be addressed. Um, and so I think at a minimum, we should be looking moving forward to make sure that's addressed. Like I said, it would seem to me that Holland and Knight could have just said, we already provide these services, there's zero additional cost. There'd be no question about it, but I, I'm not sure, you know, there is a, a disconnect somewhere there. Just, and, oh, sorry, and, and just to be clear so everyone understands, both this time and prior to this, <laughs> four members of this board, the HART board, were, are on the TPO. There has been, a, and actually, um, uh, Member Williams, as well as, um, Ms. LeGrand were on the TPO board. Five members of that board is a lot of representation. So I just, you know, and those are actual members. So um, what we need um, outside of that, besides those people speaking with whatever voice they will, although I'm not sure we had a, uh, a policy with regards to this because it wasn't really 
because of the turmoil we were in, there wasn't really a lot of um, discussion about you know that, those things. I, it, but I, I yes, go ahead. I was going to go ahead and just I I, I I think we all are kind of in an agreement that where the regional part let, let's I think we put that aside. I think we kind of have pushed that off the table. I think um, obviously. If, oh, I, I, I would just if I, if I may just one comment on that. Um, we feel up here, or members of the board feel, that there's adequate regional representation. But obviously, the troops don't feel that way. So there's, there could potentially be something that we're missing. And if, if we as a board and the, and the, the uh, uh, representatives that are TPO and, and everything else, maybe we need to step back and listen and say, OK, what aren't we doing uh, in, in representing heart for, for, for uh, uh, the local regional issue and not it's not it's not an indictment on anybody but if if they feel that there's a problem that's something we need to look into in the future not today not that we could do about it today but we need to listen and say okay did we drop the ball where did we drop the ball what do we need to do better at a regional a regional uh, capacity to, to lobby better for heart regionally and I understand your point I would just say that we're talking about two members of the staff that were in discussion and one member who is who is fairly new to the area or to heart. Um, so I, I, I'm just going to give it that weight because I'm not sure that that's the opinion of even a prevailing opinion among the staff. I don't know. But um, I just, um, you know, it's not as if um, the, um, a mandate came and if it, if it was there, it should have been something that was, again, that should be a, a board discussion. And um, so I just think that that's important. But I just, as a counter. Just, just, to, be, just to be clear, I'm not, man, I'm not suggesting we go with the regional. Right. Okay. I'm just saying that afterwards we need to do a little bit of a post-mortem as to what, 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 what are we missing so that we can you know, fill, that, fill that hole. That's all I'm saying. Okay. So with that... I don't know if there's any more discussion here. I guess we're landing on the discussion of um, um, what we have here are two uh, federal and state with um, Gray Robinson and Holland and Knight on both of them. Is there um, any? I, I, oh, I wanted to hear a little bit more about what happens on the if, so if we decide, because there is an option here on Holland and Knight's contract for us to be able to extend for one year, correct, or I don't, I don't know who I should be referring this to. <laughs> uh, if, so if we did extend the contract for one year, uh, we'd be getting the same services from Holland and Knight, correct? Correct. And how much would that save the organization for, for one year? 30, 32%, the dollar savings would be, I don't have the dollar savings. Is that the $154,000? Correct. No, that's right. the savings? No. Or is that the, that's the dollar amount that they would that's be? annual paying. cost. Okay. Uh -huh. And the cheapest that we would be right now, at, or that we would be at, would be the, what, 204000 if we did Holland and Knight at the federal, and then Gray at uh, the state and regional it would be at 204? Right. Okay. Well, and that includes the, re yes, that includes the regional. Okay. So if we did, so we were actually, I, mean, I guess we could kind of look at it as it's not, it's more than, we took the $48,000 off, so it's actually more if we're getting rid of the regional part of it, the way I'm reading that, so it'd be closer to $100,000 that we'd be saving a year. So that 32% increase number would be a little off. Correct. Okay. I don't know what the the thoughts of everybody, everybody else is right now, but oh, because of the fact that w some of the financial issues that we are looking at with the with the organization, uh, the previous leadership issues that have been well documented uh, here recently, I I think it would be we've got a, so much change and so many things that are going on right now. There needs to be I think some type of a steadying. Oh, 
so, some kind of a, a steadiness that we have not had. I think that Mr. Drainville, from an administrative standpoint, has been able to help with that. I think that maybe it, may, it would be something for us to consider to activate maybe that one-year option and then allow Mr. Drainville to work with Holland and Knight uh, for one year, try and find a way to be able to see if that is the if the issue is the legislative side of things, if it's an administrative side of things, figure out how we go from there. But when it's going to save us $100,000, I think that is something that we really need to consider. So, um, so the motion is one year for uh, Holland and Knight in both state and Well, I guess to, I, does the motion need to be all, all to activate the all the option year in the Holland and Knight contract? I just want to make sure I'm saying that right. I, um, you know, I think you could do the uh, either. I, I mean, the way I see it is, it's the one year or uh, two year. And, I would and like this to, is a recommendation to the full board, right. which I, you know, we had our presentations as well to the full board bef before, and it seems like, well, we can't do it over again because, you know, we the the way it was done, it's almost like we should just play what 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 occurred. But um, as we were doing it, I was remembering the past years we've done it, and it really should have just come probably straight to the full board instead of um, in, in this uh, manner. But well, for discussion purposes, let me do this. Uh, I'd like to make the motion to activate the uh, year one option uh, for the Holland and Knight contract. Okay. I just want to make sure. I, I only want it to be one year, and I'll, t I'll talk more about that once we okay. get into it. Second. And, okay. Right, so we have a motion and a second. Um, and I would totally agree with that. I would even go with uh, two year, quite honestly. Oh. Well, and the, and the reason I didn't do the two year is because I think that I want to be able to see that because I've and I've spoken with the previous CEO, I've spoken with Mr. Drainville about about Holland and I because I think that Gray came came in with a very solid, uh, uh, very solid uh, performance. And I, I, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that we have a lot of the other things going on, I would be very, uh, I'd be right there with probably being able to um, vote for that right now uh, for the great uh, contract. But I think that with everything going on, I think having one year to be able to figure out whether or not figuring out, make, making sure that we are getting the, what we're paying for from Holland and Knight when we have uh, a competent CEO who is going out and doing and giving the direction to be able to go to lead the efforts. You know, at, at the end of the day, it's uh, it's. It's going to be on whoever the CEO is and the board to be able to give direction to whatever firm that we select today. If, you know, in, in the previous example, and I heard plenty of anecdotes about how, you know, the firm didn't know where they were supposed to be going from a direction standpoint. And if they're, if we as a board or we, or, or Mr. Drainville, if he's, if they're not getting specific direction on what a legislative agenda is or what we are actually looking to go and do, then I, I don't think that. Us, we could have every lobbying firm in the in the country. We are not going to be able to do anything because we're going to sit here and continue to spin our wheels like we've done year after year. So that that's where that's where I come from. On the, I think the one year would be all perfect enough or enough time to give Holland and Knight and Mr. Drainville that they will have one year to be able to show us if they can actually do it. And if they can't, you know what? Tell, tell Gray to be able to apply for the next one because I think that there would be certainly an appetite to be able to look at Holland and Knight's performance at that point. Um, and I'll, I'll just say back on it, um, I, I was really impressed by Holland and Knight. I've been impressed by Holland and Knight's work as well as their presentation that they just made. Um, and as they said, uh, you know, and as we saw, they're representing transit agencies around the country. They have a specialty in that. It's a real strength that um, is not held by any of the other presenters at all. Um, they were the ones that spoke. They said two dozen transit agencies. I think that makes a difference. We didn't hear a thing about that uh, in terms of Gray Robinson. I don't know. Maybe they did. But um, we, they were able to list off the number of, um, you know, uh, the case for how they had brought in um, dollars. They were very familiar with the bus and bus stop and have worked on 
on that um, in terms of uh, crafting the applications and being with us for Tiger Build and the RAISE grant. And I think, of course, one of our um, big issues is that we haven't had a local match for um, so many other things um, that, you know, we, we, and even our community has been there with us. I don't think we even need um, convincing anymore for the community as far as I'm concerned, you know, so um, I don't know uh, where we uh, go with that, but I'll say that they have also, um, to me, very strong representation in terms of the integration that they've had for years at the state level um, and um, the national level and the local level um, is, is extremely strong. And I was very appreciative that they brought up the safe public transit um, uh, work that they had done in the state, which was our crisis um, here affected us, but I think we're seeing it all over the country um, now. Unfortunately, we were one of the first to experience that, as well as um, they, they talked about that heavy um, maintenance um, facility that we have, you know, um, and we, uh, you know, they are familiar with that. I have met with them in Washington with the FTA. I know that they have, uh, and they, they gave us lots of um, good guidance on working at that, and we got a lot of explanation um, when, you know, when I've been there, um, and as well with um, uh, Congresswoman Castor. And I know that you know, she's been very focused, and that's why we have um, gotten um, transit investment. So I just, I'd, I, I'll say I think um, despite the issues that have been here, I do think we, uh, you know, have had effective representation for the things that we um, have brought forward and, and the best representation. And I really think it's good to have someone that also has uh, – you know, has a, a team that is involved in transit with other transit agencies. I think that that's a, a, a very a good strength for us. So I, I just want to, that's just in general my um, thoughts about um, Holland and I, uh, as a, uh, and I just want to, uh, you know, share that with the, the board as we sit as well. It, Can I, go ahead. Well, I was just, I was, as far as, I agree with you that Holland and Knight has done a, a great job, even despite what we have been, you know, probably given them to be able to try and work with recently in, in the last few years. Uh, now, I mean, one thing that, you know, I, again, I think it's going to come down to the best value, which is going to be that price thing for me on this. But I think that um, I was very intrigued with Gray's proposal on the the and. Because of the fact, and again, being you know for us being able to pay attention on the local side of things, they have done a tremendous job with the airport, bringing in the amount of money that they have brought in. They've got transportation experience throughout the state. You know, you know, not only the state regionally, federally. We, we, but I think that in a year, that's the kind of stuff I want to be able to see those types of results with Holland and Knight. And I, I think that with the right direction, we could probably move and you know have a better opportunity for that. So I, I just want to make sure that, you know, that part is pointed out as well. And that, it's fine. I, I would just, just in terms of airports, and ports are treated a lot nicer. Oh, no, I, the, I agree. I, I agree. <laughs> you're right. You're right. state government. But so, the, uh, the fact that they're able to bring in those kind of dollars for those projects, I think it's, you know, it's, yeah. you know from a percentage standpoint, we're, I'm not expecting to get billions of dollars for, for HART next year. From either entity or from any all agency that we hire, but you know, I think that it shows success in the transportation arena that, that we would want to be able to see, especially when we have that all heavy maintenance facility we want to, we want to get done. I'll just just say that um, you know, fully recognizing that Holland and Knight has the benefit of having provided these services already to Hart, um, and probably to some of you individually in other capacities. Um, that they have an advantage because they can reference current projects that they're working on. Um, I will have rotated off the board by the time this comes back to you. So I would just urge you to, what I don't want is for other companies or other potential lobbying groups to feel as if it's moot to even apply for this RFP if we've already made up our mind that Holland Knight is just the, the company that we want to move forward with. 
um, just in the future. And just also, just to piggyback on what I said, we have had a lot of turmoil in terms of, you know, what was going on with our CEO, changes in staff. Um, I think there's a disconnect there that I hope is not overlooked in this upcoming year. I, I do think, you know, Director Johnson, you've, you've mentioned it, um, just moving forward to just get the best and the most benefit out of our lobbying group that we, we pay attention to that. Um, so I, I just wanted to put that. And I will, I will say, having looked at all of the applications, um, there were some very strong applications. And in fact, Ray Robinson had a higher technical score than Holland and Knight on the state level. I'll just um, just follow up with um, my recommendation. It's going to be a new business is for us to look at the regional legislation needs based on what you recommended, Schlissler, and why the technical scores are much lower than the other scores and what the needs of the staff are in comparison to what we're getting. So this screams a standout that we need to take a follow-up or an action item to get deeper into what the needs are and make sure we meet those regardless of what happens here. So I, that would be my, my recommendation just as a um, addition. I don't know if we need a, a nomination. Well, I, if you're going to bring that business. up in future items, you can certainly oh. bring that up in oh, okay. future so I don't items. Have, okay, thank you. Um, so I guess um, we have a, um, a motion and a second. Um, and is there any further discussion? So this will just be a recommendation to the full board, correct? Okay. Um, all those in, uh, well, I guess. Uh, May I'm I sorry, take a we'll roll, call. roll call vote? Yeah. Thank you. I was just thinking about the. Committee member Johnson? Yes. Committee member Kim? Yes. Committee member Schistler? Yes. Committee member Williams? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Um, may I go get Miss Mandel so we can conduct um, elections? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I understand we're on elections at this time. Um, where we left uh, the last uh, uh, item was election of, of the committee chair, and we had two nominations. One was co for Commissioner Kemp, and the other one was for um, uh, Mr. Uh, Board Member Johnson, and um, we had a vote of one to two, two for Board Member Johnson, one for Commissioner Kemp. So I wanted to uh, have a full vote of the board for of the committee for the purposes of board member Johnson to serve as chair. And we would need the, me uh, the members of the committee to take that vote at this time. We did a bit, we already did the action, so now we were just on the point of being the, just let me step back. We were on the point of being the full vote. We can step back into the nominating process. That might be cleaner given that uh, Director Williams was not here. How would I'm you I'm sorry, what would you like to be? Who, who were the candidates, Commissioner Kemp and but, you Director know Johnson? I think we yes. closed nomination, so it would just be a matter of just voting. voting we're voting. On, that's that's yeah. where, we, right. where we stand is a matter of voting on the closed nominations with Mr. Johnson receiving two votes and, um, Ms., uh, and Commissioner Kemp receiving one vote. And we can either go to a full vote of the committee now, or if we want to step back and do nominations, we can do that too, because it got a little confused by the timing. But where we stand right now is you have a closed nomination and an opportunity for a vote. Okay. And Mr., and Mr. Johnson received two votes in the, uh, before the nominations were closed. Okay, I nominate, I vote for Director Johnson. Okay, why don't we go ahead and uh, ask for a motion and full vote. I need, can one of you make a motion to? Motion for a full vote. Thank you. Committee Member Johnson? Yes. Committee Member Kemp? No. Committee, Committee Member Schistler? Yes. Committee Member Williams? Yes. 
Motion passes unanimously electing committee member Johnson as committee chair. Uh, thank you and congratulations. Now we need to have uh, a motion, uh, a nomination for our vice chair of the committee. I'd like to nominate Commissioner Kemp. Second. Are there any additional nominations? Nominations are closed. If we can um, take action on nomination of uh, Commissioner Kemp as vice chair. Again, a roll call. Vote. Committee member Johnson. Yes. Committee member Kemp. Yes. Committee member Schistler. Yes. Committee member Williams. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I, w I would like to know for the record that we still have one uh, additional seat uh, on this uh, committee and we will work with the chair to get that filled. Thank you. Well, I'll go ahead and finish off the meeting uh, for, for the rest of to, for today. Is there any old business? Is there any new business? Uh, new business based on the uh, low, lower scores for technical um, aspect of the bid. Uh, I'd like to ask that we go back and look at what were the causes and identify the gaps that staff has brought forward so we can make sure we take care of those gaps as we move forward over the next year um, with the addition of the one-year contract. So that's a request to bring back uh, an information item on that issue? Yes. And not so much as information item. Yes, I'll just say yes. Thank you. Um, can, can I I'd just like to add, I think definitely, and I guess it's, um, I could maybe assume this, but I'd just like to make sure that our interim director, Mr. Drainville, is engaged in that as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Is there any additional new business? I've got something real fast. I'll, I think after having that conversation regarding the uh, leadership and how it's going to be so critical when it comes to implementing a legislative agenda and also just the general direction of the organization. Uh, I'd like to be able to I'll either have a conversation or go ahead and start moving forward on making a recommendation to the board to I'll start exploring I'll taking the interim tag off of Mr. Drainville's I'll title and I'll explore us making him the full C or the the actual CEO of the organization think with everything that is going on currently, I think that we need to move forward as fast as we can and I think it'd be something we need to either have a discussion about or uh, go ahead and bring it to the full board where we can have that conversation sooner rather than later. Uh, Second. I think that's already been, did, didn't you bring that? We brought that up last meeting, but we haven't really, it just kind of sort of just hung out there like a. What I might recommend is you make a motion to put on the full board agenda, that as an agenda item. So that way you can have that as part of your discussion at your full board. And then a decision can be made at that time as to how you would like to proceed forward. Uh, then I'll, I'll make the motion to I'll bring to the full board the uh, discussion item on uh, making Mr. Drainville the CEO of HART. I think everybody seconds it. Committee member Johnson, Committee Chair Johnson? Yes. Committee member Kemp? Yes. Committee member Schistler? Yes. Committee member Williams? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. If there, is there any other additional new business? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.